Good afternoon, everyone. Kumusta po kayong lahat? I hope that you're still safe and hopeful during this time of pandemic and ready for this afternoon's National Situation or Update. My name is Marshall Murillo of the Social Sciences Department at Teneo Dinaga University, and I will be your MC and moderator for this webinar. To formally start, may I invite everyone to join the invocation to be led by the Ateneo de Naga University Choir. Take, Lord, receive. Thank you, University Choir, and to their program director, Mr. Joseph Rebriano. The Ateneo de Naga University Office of Student Affairs is proud to present to you the seventh in the webinar series organized by the office for this school year. This webinar is being viewed not only by Ateneans, but by students and professionals from other schools, thanks to the cooperation of the Philippine Association of Practitioners of Student Affairs and Services, PAPSAS Region 5. The National Situation or Update, or commonly known as NATSEAT, is an annual offering of Ateneo de Naga University Office of Student Affairs that aims at raising the awareness and understanding of students in social, political, and economic, and other specific issues affecting the youth and the state of the nation, while motivating them to critically and intelligently think and react to the issues. The NATSIT is part of OSA's Ateneo Leadership Development Program, or ALDP, the overarching leadership program for student leaders and organizations. The NATSIT addresses one of ALDP's areas of growth, which is social responsibility. This is the 13th year that OSA has sustained the implementation of NATSIT, and the first time that the program shall be held fully online. For this year's NATSI, the speaker will be discussing the struggle for enlightenment or the pursuit of truth in the age of disinformation. Let me now share with you the schedule of today's webinar. There will be two parts. The first part is a talk of the speaker, while the second part is the open forum. If you have any questions or comments in the presentation of the speaker, kindly post them on the comment section of Adno Osa Facebook. Please state your name, the school or organization you represent, and your brief question or comment. Later, during the open forum, we will address them through the respective speaker and reactors. 
E-certificates will be given to those who pre-registered and who will accomplish the evaluation form. We will provide the link for the evaluation at the end of this webinar. We hope that you will gain new and useful learning from this webinar. To give his opening remarks, may we now call on our university president, Father Roberto Ezequiel and Rivera SJ, to give the opening remarks. To our dear friends, our faculty, staff, students, our esteemed guests, and to the Ateneo de Nagra University community gathered for this national situation or update. A pleasant day to all of you. Just Marhain Aldo sa Sendo Gabos. I am very pleased and honored to welcome all of you to this online forum where we will listen to updates on the national situation. Above all, I am very grateful and truly honored on behalf of the university to welcome to this forum, Mr. Horacio Tawi Severino. I am truly uh, honored that we have such a distinguished guest, a pioneer in news reporting and investigative journalism, a champion of press freedom. I believe that with Mr. Severino guiding us in this afternoon's forum, and from his unique perspective as a chronicler and observer of the many important events in our country in the past decades, and most especially during this pandemic, we will be given deeper insight into what is happening in our nation and the prospects for recovery and development this 2021. Uh, I believe that we in the Ateneo de Naga University are constantly called, despite the many difficulties we are experienced, to make a difference in our country, in our task of education, in our outreach efforts. But all of this hinge on a thorough and objective understanding of the challenges we face. We look forward to this afternoon's session where we will not only be informed but surely challenged by Mr. Severino in his talk. Once again, our gratitude to our distinguished guest speaker and to all of you for your presence in this afternoon's forum. Just marhay na hapon sa Sendo Gabos, just mabalus po. Thank you, Father Robert. Allow me now to introduce the resource speaker for this afternoon's NADSEED. Horacio Howie Severino has been a journalist for 32 years and has produced over 200 TV documentaries, at least a dozen of which have won domestic and international awards. Howie anchored the morning news at GMA News TV for eight years. From 2009 to 2014, he was the editor-in-chief of GMA News Online and head of GMA News social media operations. In other stages of his career, he was a newspaper reporter, book and magazine editor, and a co-founder of the Philippine Center for Investigative Journalism, of which he is still the chairman of the Board of Trustees. He is currently a vice president of GMA Network, responsible for training and development of its journalists, as well as policies related to journalist safety. He graduated from the Ateneo de Manila High School in Tufts University in Massachusetts with a degree in history, magna cum laude, and received his master's degree from Sussex University in the UK. How is a COVID survivor after spending 11 days in isolation in a COVID referral hospital? His documentary on his experience, Ako si Patient 2828, recently won Best Documentary in the recent Gawad Tanglao Awards. A trivia about our speaker, did you know that Howie was named after the Jesuit priest and historian Horacio de la Costa SJ? Now we all know. Please welcome the resource speaker of this year's NATSIT to talk about the struggle for enlightenment or the pursuit of truth in the age of disinformation, Howie Severino. Magandang hapon sa inyong lahat. Uh, thank you so much uh, for welcoming me. Thank you, uh, Father Rivera. And... Uh, uh, I, you know, uh, we're actually 
far from each other, and yet uh, I feel close to uh, many of you. Uh, Father uh, Rivera and I uh, uh, exchanged some memories from uh, the 80s. Uh, no? and, uh, we just commemorated uh, the people power revolution no? that uh, Father Rivera and I uh, recall so uh, vividly. And it's related to the theme uh, that I'll be discussing uh, with all of you uh, today. Um, yung national situation kasi natin uh, is quite complicated and we can go very granular about it, especially with elections around the corner, uh, and so many political opinions uh, proliferating, but I decided not to go there. Uh, I, I told uh, Leo that uh, I would prefer putting our topic in a wider global and historical context and sharing some advice about how to think about our national situation. And then maybe uh, in, if there's time in the question and answer, maybe we can uh, discuss um, the, finer, the finer points of our uh, national situation. But um, for our purpose today, um, I decided to uh, provide a little history and this international situation today, the tensions that are roiling uh, the global community and try to situate our own country uh, within this kind of context. So I'm gonna be sharing my screen. So my topic is the struggle for enlightenment or the pursuit of truth in the age of disinformation. So enlightenment uh, will be, I'll be discussing enlightenment uh, in two contexts. One, uh, enlightenment with a small e and enlightenment uh, with a capital E. Uh, and I'm going to elaborate uh, in a uh, little while. So um, I've been a journalist for 33 years now. So I've seen a lot of history. I've experienced a lot of um, uh, a lot of the world and a lot of what's happened in the country. Uh, excuse me for a minute. Sorry. And I've been a journalist uh, from the 80s up to today. And I like to think that I'm I am still physically fit um, and mentally fit uh, after 33 years, despite uh, my bout with COVID early on in the, uh, in the pandemic. I got sick in March, I got well uh, in April, and by uh, May, I was already uh, biking again. You know? um, but I, um, I've been, like many of you, I've been working mostly uh, from home, doing a lot of reflection, doing a lot of writing. And, and occasionally um, going to the field. But uh, my mission has not stopped, which is the pursuit and presentation of truth. That is basically our duty to society and to the world, which is to find facts and present facts in the form of stories so that they are interesting enough for everyone to pay attention. So our purpose is to enlighten. Okay, so according to the Oxford Dictionary, uh, to enlighten is to give someone greater knowledge and understanding about a subject or situation. So that's enlighten with a small e. And you cannot enlighten without facts, evidence, and science. Uh, this is a very important point because there are a lot of people now uh, empowered by technology who are trying to enlighten but are not using facts evidence, or science. So our situation today where we have access to facts and science um, is a relatively new phenomenon. Um, uh, for much of human history, in fact, uh, people didn't have access to facts and science. And what mattered was superstition and what I call bossism, which is basically Whatever the boss says is what should be obeyed. Whatever the boss says is what we should believe. So there was no, there was no 
use for facts. There was no use for science because someone made someone else told us what to think. Someone else told us what to do, told us what to believe. And government back then, politics back then was um, basically, there was just one system and it was ruled by divine right and hereditary monarchy. So divine right, divine right of kings, uh, if you recall, uh, for many centuries, popes were considered infallible. They were like gods on earth. And power was inherited by kings, queens, princes, princesses. You might think that the equivalent of that today are, are the dynasties, the political dynasties. But there have been cases where political dynasties, including those in parts of Bicol, have been defeated by newcomers by people who did not inherit power. So we have kind of a hybrid today of the kind of politics uh, that have developed over centuries. But for the most part of history, we people were living in what were the dark ages. The dark ages because hindi nga enlightened. Walang light. There was no light of reason, there was no light of knowledge, there was no light of freedom, etc. That's why the mid from for for many, many centuries, uh, including the medieval period, they were called the Dark Ages. And um the Adam Gopnik, uh, a popular writer, he writes for the New Yorker, no, he wrote an article that I was just reading recently, and Sabinya, you know. Uh, we seem so shocked by, uh, you know, the actuations of leaders like Donald Trump or the leader in Brazil, but uh, they have actually been, you know, their style of leadership, dictatorship, has actually been the default condition of humanity. Itong pag-asa natin na mahalal, yung mga mas mabubuting leader, yung mas democratic leader, this is a relatively new development in human history. Excuse me. Sorry. So, uh, nag, nag umpisa lang to, uh, this new way of thinking, uh, nung age of enlightenment. Uh, the age of enlightenment, if uh, those of you have uh, taken a little bit of history, uh, was a movement in the 17th and 18th centuries that set the stage for the modern world. So for the longest time, People were living in the dark ages. Entire societies were living in the dark ages where leaders ruled by divine, divine right and inherited power. And all of a sudden, nabulabog, na disrupt yung sistema na yan in the age of the Enlightenment. So this was preceded by the scientific revolution, you know, Isaac Newton, uh, you know, people were discovering that the earth was not flat pala. Uh, there's such a thing as you know, uh, you know, stars are not are not uh, supernatural things, but they're actually um, uh, governed by natural laws, uh, etc. Um, but you know, this this new this new field of knowledge, this this new development in human history, undermined the authority of monarch of the monarchy and the Catholic Church, um, which both of which used to call the shots. If you recall, I mean, this is the 500th uh, year of Magellan's arrival in, in the, this is, we're commemorating the 500th anniversary of uh, Magellan's arrival in uh, the Philippines. The person who, who made the decision and funded his trip around the world was uh, a king. It was not the president, it was not a legislature, it was not uh, anyone elected, etc. It was It was a king. So they had almost limitless power for a very, very long time. And the Age of Enlightenment paved the way for political revolution. So I've talked about, I've mentioned two concepts of enlightenment. Enlightenment with a small e, which is basically to share and provide knowledge, to, to light up other people's minds. And then there's the enlightenment with a large e, which refers to a particular movement, refers to a particular period of history. 
Now, the Age of Enlightenment produced knowledge, but also introduced values. It introduced new values, which, again, disrupted the way many people thought, the way societies were organized and ruled and governed. Because all of a sudden, individuals were no longer expected to be blind followers. They were no, they were no longer powerless over their own destiny. All of a sudden, they had agency. They had what they were told was reason. They could learn to read and write. They could learn things about places that are far away. They could learn about science. And they suddenly widened their minds and their consciousness to think about concepts like liberty. They thought that, hey, there's another way to live aside from slavery or being the subjects of my king or, you know, I actually have choices in life. And the concept of tolerance, because previously, you know, if you belong to another religion, another tribe, another race, etc., cetera, um, there was a general attitude of intolerance. Uh, you were automatically uh, uh, often an enemy based on your religion, based on your, the color of your skin, etc., but then the Age of Enlightenment, you know, introduced concepts like equality and religious tolerance. And this is something very radical for that time, which we take for granted today. Uh, it was also during the Age of Enlightenment, which introduced the concept of separation of church and state, which you've, many of you have probably studied uh, when studying the Constitution, uh, political science, etc., cetera, and, and representative government. Previously, there was no such thing. This was such an alien concept because the government was just the king. Whatever the, gover whatever the king said, that's what was followed. So Pilipinas, we were deeply influenced by the Age of Enlightenment. A, you know, um, when the Philippines was opened up for trade, there were certain Indio families that generated wealth. They were able to, they could afford to send their uh, sons, mostly sons, uh, to Europe, which was the kind of center of learning in the world uh, in the 19th century. Starting in the 1880s, a whole slew of talented, well-to-do uh, well Filipinos, ambitious Filipinos made it to Europe and studied. They didn't go there to study the priesthood. They did not go there to study superstition or or uh, you know, magic or anything else uh, except science, uh, engineering. They studied um, uh, medicine. They studied uh, basically you know, the things that had to do with the natural laws of the world. And sometimes, uh, as in the case of Rizal, they studied uh, these various branches of knowledge to bring back home, to build a nation. So they were called ilustrados, no? Uh, and ilustrados, uh, loosely translated, means uh, the enlightened ones, the enlightened ones. So yeah, kasama dyan sila, Marcelo del Pilar, or Plaridel, uh, Graciano Lopez Haena, the Luna brothers, Juan and Antonio, uh, si the Padre de Taveras, especially uh, one of uh, Rizal's best friends, um, uh, si TH, uh, Trinidad, uh, Padre de Tavera, Mariano Ponce et al. They were educated in Europe and influenced by Enlightenment values. Not just the knowledge generated by the Age of Enlightenment, but the values that were introduced by the Enlightenment. And the Enlightenment also introduced certain attitudes, like skepticism. I said that you had no choice but to be a blind follower. Otherwise, you'd be killed, right? Or you'd be exiled, or you'd be punished. Wala kang choice, except to blindly follow, blindly believe, etc. All of a sudden, you had access to other, you had access to knowledge. You could actually think for yourself. You had agency. You had the, the power of reason. And you had the power to be skeptical. Because with your knowledge, with your enlightenment, 
you could actually doubt things. You could actually doubt conventional wisdom. You could actually question not just assumptions, the assumptions of the day, but you could actually question authority or dogma. So this is a good attitude to have today. Today, because sometimes we're being asked to just believe something or we see something on the internet and we share without really investigating, without trying to find out whether it is true or not. But in the age of enlightenment, Panahon Rizal, up to today, to be enlightened is to be skeptical. We need to be skeptical. Basically, I was uh, mentioning that uh, see Benedict, uh, that Benedict Anderson uh, uh, popularized the theory of nations as imagined communities because uh, uh, nations don't don't happen uh, automatically. You no, know? uh, unlike uh, families, you have an automatic uh, sense of kinship or tribes. You know, you feel something in common with your uh, fellow. Uh, uh, tribal member, but a nation, you have to have something more in common. Uh, and you have to imagine a commonality. Yung nga, sabi nga ni Benedict Anderson, a nation is imagined because the members of even the smallest nation will never know most of their fellow members, meet them or even hear of them, yet in the minds of each lives the image of their communion. And uh, I don't know kung uh, kung pwedeng ipakita ngayon ni ni Leo na no? the next uh, the next slide uh, yung concept ni Saint Augustine of a nation he says uh, Saint Augustine who's a well known theologian and philosopher a nation is a multitude defined by the common objects of their love a nation is a multitude defined by the common objects of their love. Uh, I, I was reminded of this because uh, President Joe Biden in the United States uh, actually mentioned this concept of uh, set this uh, quote by St. Augustine in his inaugural address. So back to Rizal, no? Rizal imagined a national community. He was, uh, you know, the Filipino nation is a diverse multitude. And you would think with so many islands, we don't really have much in common. It, but it was Rizal who first articulated the common objects of its love, to quote St. Augustine, or the values that he envisioned for the new nation. So what are those values promoted by Rizal? So Rizal, you know, wrote, 20 volumes of writings, including, you know, letters, um, essays, newspaper articles, in addition to his uh, novel. So those values promoted by Rizal are freedom of expression, political representation, individual rights, pluralism, separation of church and state, secularism, rule of law, Justice and fairness. Yeah. Oh, thank you, Father uh, Rivera. Yeah. So, um, yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Nakahabol. Thank you. So, uh, ito mga pinopromote results sa writings niya. Okay. Uh, freedom of expression, political representation. Uh, si, si Rizal, uh, early on in his career, was not advocating independence, not because he didn't believe in it, but because he felt that. Uh, we didn't have enough weapons to fight for our independence. So he, he, he opted for uh, advocacy. Uh, he opted for lobbying for representation in the Spanish Cortes. Uh, and he just wanted justice and fairness for Filipinos, for uh, natives, for the Indios. You know? um, and, uh, you know, because he was influenced by his uh, eight years in Europe, uh, he, he felt that whatever the Europeans were advocating for themselves uh, could also be or should also be advocated for Filipinos. Filipinos should be advocating the same values for their own budding nation. 
So kasama dyan, of course, uh, rule of law, secularism, separation of church and state, justice and fairness, respect for heritage. You know, uh, Rizal was a big student of history. He, he annotated Morga. Uh, science and education. Uh, we know that Rizal, of course, was a man of science. He was a doctor. Uh, he was also an educator. He spent four years in Dapitan as an exile teaching. He set up a school. And of course, he was an advocate of the truth. And, uh, you, know, uh, he's, you know, he's also a man of science. He was very interested in science, uh, not just medicine, but uh, botany, uh, et cetera. So basically, uh, Rizal was um, a man of the enlightenment and the values that he was advocating for the Philippines, the values that he envisioned would be the foundation for the new Filipino nation were enlightenment values or enlightenment values. And, you know, uh, which I find it, which I find ironic whenever someone criticizes human rights in the Philippines uh, as if it's somehow, you know, kind of, uh, it's kind of against the interests of the country when all of these values I just mentioned you know, freedom of expression, uh, justice, fairness, representation, etc. Those are human rights. Those are human rights. So the vision that Rizal advocated for the Philippines, for the new Filipino nation, was a vision founded on human rights. So let's not knock human rights unless, you know, we want to tear down Rizal and uh, repudiate or reject what he stood for. And uh, the next slide, uh, I want to show the influence of Rizal because uh, the very first uh, constitution by the wise men, uh, and they were all men, and in 1899, they all gathered in uh, Malolos, uh, you know, led by Apolinario Mabini, a uh, very wise uh, lawyer and the uh, uh, right-hand man, ni, ni Aguinaldo, uh, enshrines a concept of rights in the constitution. And enshrines enlightenment values. I mean, just read just these excerpts, no? The freedom and equality of all religions. So, hindi lang pang katoliko ang Pilipinas. It recognizes Islam. It recognizes Buddhism. It recognizes any religion as well as the separation of the church and state. So, the Catholic Church is not empowered to be the government in the Philippines. It, it From the very beginning of our country, uh, as a nation, uh, in the first constitution, kinilala na yan. And that is Rizal's influence. That is the influence of the Enlightenment. And Article 22, uh, Article 20, no Filipino shall be deprived of the right to freely express his ideas or opinions orally or in writing through the use of the press or other similar means. Freedom of the press was part of the vision of the founding fathers. This is not some new thing. Invented by you know uh, Dili Dilawans or Rappler or you know any of anyone uh, who's been persecuted lately. Uh, uh, sa pala ng ating bansa ay naka na ang freedom of the press, freedom of the right of association for the purposes of human life, and which are not contrary to public morals. So tuloy yan, 1935 Philippine Constitution under the Americans. There's a Bill of Rights. No law shall be passed abridging the freedom of speech or of the press, or the right of the people peaceably to assemble and petition the government for redress of grievances. Again, reiterated, one, institute, one constitution after the other, freedom of the press, no law shall be passed. Hanggang ngayon, nandiyan pa rin yan, sa 1987 constitution. So 1935 constitution was not perfect. I want to point this out. No? Dun, an, sa ilalim ng suffrage or yung voting rights, Section 1, suffrage may be exercised by male citizens of the Philippines, not otherwise disqualified by law, who are 21 years of age or over and are able to read and write. Male, hindi binanggit yung female. No? So, uh, yung voting rights of women in the Philippines uh, uh, only became legal, only existed starting 1937 and then was incorporated in the 1935 Constitution. 1987, Philippine Constitution. And gender yung freedom of the press, freedom of assembly, etc. But in addition, in Section 7, it includes uh, the right of the people to information on matters of public concern. 
access to official records and to documents and papers pertaining to official acts, etc. In other words, this is the freedom of information. The right to information is the freedom of information, which is contained in a law, the FOI, which journalists, lawyers, academics, uh, and various uh, advocates, civil society uh, activists have, have used to gain access to uh, documents hidden in government bureaucracies. So, nag-umpisa din yan doon sa concept of accountability, concept of uh, freedom of the press. Uh, next slide, please. So, uh, today uh, and throughout modern uh, history, there has been a constant tension and often um, exploding in open conflict. The age of enlightenment values versus the bosses and values or the values of the dark ages. So basically the values of light and the values of darkness. So ano ba yung bosses and values? Ang importante sa boss, sa mga boss, loyalty. It doesn't matter if you're honest or not. It doesn't matter if you're competent or not. It doesn't, you know, very few other things matter except loyalty. Only the wishes of the boss matter. And intolerance. You know, if you're, uh, if uh, like uh, in the United States uh, for a for a while under Trump, uh, immigrants and Muslims were demonized. So there was a lot of racism. He would make fun of Asian people, uh, etc. Uh, in the Philippines, uh, there's also been uh, you know intolerance for recently for drug offenders, uh, drug users. So they've been killed. So. When I say bossism, it's not only fascism and modern authoritarianism, but one man rules through the ages. So that's kings and emperors, popes, tattoos, or anyone in authority whose word was law. No? So uh, it could be a, a much smaller setting. It could be you know, a student organization where you know, the, the president uh, acts like an authoritarian. It can be the teacher in the classroom who acts like a dictator and doesn't listen to other people. It could be the president of a university. It could be, et cetera. So these are two competing sets of values, the values of the enlightenment and the values of bossism. So I want to distinguish, no? Hindi naman lahat ng boss, hindi naman lahat ng bossism ay evil, hindi naman lahat ay abusive, hindi naman lahat. May tinatawag na na benevolent bossism. Just because you're the only one making decisions, you're the only one calling the shots, doesn't mean you're making bad decisions or you're being unfair or you're being evil or abusive. So there's a difference between a benevolent boss and tyrants or tyranny. Okay, So I'm going to discuss tyranny for a little while because that's a big trend now around the world. Tyranny is becoming popular again. Tyranny is a trend. So ano ba yung playbook ng tyranny. So, uh, itong playbook na to ay um, ang uh, isang uh, nagpauso uh, nito ay si Putin sa Russia. You know, you create fear of the boss. Uh, if, uh, if you criticize the boss, if you expose the boss, you can be killed. Uh, secondly, you stoke hatred of certain population groups, including critics. Di ba? Uh, tyrants hate critics. They don't like, that's why they don't like freedom of the press. They use propaganda to build the cult of the leader. Okay, we, we see this in North Korea. We see this, uh, well, we saw this in the United States. We see this in Russia. We see this in China under Xi Jinping, etc. You cancel liberty and the free press. Okay, tyrants don't like freedom in general. And loyalty is the highest virtue. You you, I like you because you're loyal to me, not because you're, you are a patriotic, not because you are honest, not because uh, you are a good worker, because you are loyal to me. And the tyrant has no interest in honesty. He will lie blatantly. He will lie to, to perpetuate himself in power. He will lie. Uh, to cover up his mistakes, he will lie because he feels like it. So you look at the different uh, behaviors of tyrants in history and the world, and one of the one of their characteristics is they have not been very truthful. So 
And then there's the modern tyranny playbook. So modern tyranny uh, is the age of the internet so uh, and or the age of technology. Uh, social media has been weaponized. Uh, it's used as a weapon to, to uh, attack, to, to silence, to intimidate, to create fear, to create hatred, etc. You weaponize the law. You use the law to silence your critics, to jail your critics, uh, etc. And you attack journalists. And uh, unlike uh, under martial law, where you know to attack journalists meant you actually had to go to their homes or you actually had to threaten them physically, now you can just attack them on the internet. You can attack them online. You can attack them on uh, social media. And sometimes that's enough to intimidate journalists. So modern history uh, has been shaped by a clash of civilizations between entire enlightenment values and bossism values. And sabi ko nga, uh, uh, yeah, next slide, please. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so uh, sometimes this clash of civilizations, this tension between the enlightenment and bossism have exploded into world wars, World War I, World War II. It's a clash, uh, a clash between communism and, uh, you know, uh, uh, America in Vietnam, diba? or uh, America and Iran, etc. I mean, those are those are not just clashes between uh, governments or countries. They're clashes between values. They are clashes between civilizations. And recently, the clash of civilizations has been amplified by the internet and social media. No, so talagang sobrang na amplify na aggravate uh, naging mas dangerous because uh, all of a sudden it's powered by the internet and social media almost and, and daming ngayon sumasawsaw and daming ngayon sumasali so this is not just the realm of politicians and generals but everybody almost who's online and has an opinion uh, pwedeng sumali dito sa clash of civilizations okay uh, this next slide, the role of journalism and the news media as information shepherds has been undermined by social media and the bosses that have weaponized it. Previously, you know, journalism and the news media, we were considered gateway, the gatekeepers you know, to information. No longer, because everyone now has access. So we, some of us prefer to look at ourselves as shepherds, diba? Right? So we will, we will help guide you we will give you we can teach you we can give you we can point you in the right direction about where the facts are where the truth lies where the evidence is you go to my website and i can and i can assure you the facts there have been verified i mean so my ganun kaming role na yon. we are information shepherds so you can make good decisions about your lives but but because sometimes the information that we have, the information we can shepherd you to is critical of those in power, critical of business, critical of authority, we are being attacked as well. No? We are being demonized as fake news. We are being demonized as being unpatriotic. We are being demonized as, uh, you know, uh, uh, anti this or pro that etc no uh, so uh, so our traditional role has been upended and if you upend if you discredit uh, journalism in the news media well it's just one less guide for ordinary people in this very bewildering world of information so a, a very specific example no false as a weapon. No? So as I said, uh, bosses uh, or tyrants, uh, they lie blatantly. Uh, some newspapers, some news media in the United States have been documenting, Donald ha, have documented Donald Trump's lies uh, over four years, umaabot ni atayan ng 20,000 or something, if you count all the lies on his Twitter account, etc. But uh, one of his biggest lies was that he was cheated. Even though so many authorities, the courts, um, election, tribunals, uh, etc., all said there was no evidence of widespread cheating or rigging or fraud, etc. Donald Trump kept insisting that he was the one who won. Uh, Biden, who was declared the winner by nearly everyone else, uh, cheated him of victory. And uh, the 
the the will of the people was not uh, respected, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, what was the outcome? Well, of course, many people still believe Trump, and that created an alternate reality. So. There was a reality based on facts, which was that Biden and his running mate Kamala Harris won the last election. But then there's an alternate reality where Biden cheated Donald Trump and Donald Trump is the rightful winner of the last election. So makikita mo tong headline na to, over 70% of Republicans believe that Trump was cheated out of the election. Many more believe improprieties occurred, etc. So, it, so the outcome is not just an alternate reality. There can be a reality, a very physical reality on the ground. We know what happened in Washington, D.C. on January 6, uh, where uh, Donald Trump incited his followers to become a mob. They attacked and invaded uh, the U.S. Capitol. They were looking for political leaders there, which, whom they wanted to hang, wanted to kill, wanted to kidnap wanted to hostage. So this is a direct uh, result of the lies, the big lie that the will of the people was subverted. So that is the danger of falsehood wielded as a weapon by a tyrant. And uh, Donald Trump, of course, is not alone in using these weapons. He's just the most famous, the most prominent, and... Uh, the most shocking in a way because uh, very, many of us who have uh, been admirers of the American system and American American democracy never thought this could ever happen, but it did. So if it happened in America, it could happen almost anywhere else. All right. So disinformation. No? So um, I'm a journalist uh, who is trying to pursue the truth, trying to pursue facts and evidence, but there's so much information out there and there are different kinds of falsehood. So there is, uh, ito, uh, may gumawa, uh, res ang mga researchers, uh, Dirak Shan and Claire Wardle, who's an expert on disinformation. She created this handy, uh, user-friendly way of understanding information disorder. So uh, there's so much information out there. Previously, the problem of ordinary people was not enough information. Today, the problem of ordinary people is there's too much information and we don't know how to navigate. We don't know how to discern what's true, what's false, what's malicious, what's not, etc. So she, they, these researchers developed this taxonomy of information. Uh, so uh, there are three basic categories. Misinformation, which is basically uh, things that are not true but could be accidental. They, they are factual inaccuracies. Uh, there's probably nothing malicious about it. Then disinformation, which is deliberate, uh, but it could be satire. Uh, it could be uh, a prank. So nothing, nothing meant to cause harm. And then there is malinformation, which is falsehood or information that is intended to harm. So deliberate publication of private information for personal or corporate rather than public interest, such as revenge porn. Okay, so uh, this that's the basic difference between disinformation and misinformation. Disinformation is deliberate, and misinformation is not. Okay, uh, locally, uh, if you will look at this headline, uh, this is very worrisome uh, for uh, for those of us who are hoping that the arrival of vaccines in the Philippines and around the world will help end this crisis that we are all suffering. Uh, the only hope out of this, uh, and along with, you know, if you judge from uh, pandemics and epidemics through, through history, is a vaccine. And the, uh, the achievement of herd immunity through vaccination. Now, uh, but here in NCR, Metro Manila, it's, the figures are probably not that far off in Bicol. Uh, ang baba na mga gustong magpa vaccinate. No? So kung 25% lang ang magpapabakuna, 75% ay ang hindi, there's still going to be a lot of people out there getting sick and uh, spreading the disease. So uh, unless we change this, unless we counter the disinformation or misinformation with accurate information, with education, 
we might get stuck even if the vaccines are already available in the Philippines and other countries are already exiting the pandemic, the Philippines might be stuck. And, uh, you know, the World Health Organization's opinion reflects the opinion of scientists and doctors around the world, which is you are far more likely to be seriously injured by a vaccine preventable disease than by a vaccine. People are afraid of the vaccine, but we should be more afraid of COVID. Diba? So many people have died of COVID. More than a million people around the world have died of COVID. Uh, more than 10,000 people in the Philippines have already died of COVID. Uh, maybe we can count on one hand or two hands uh, those who have died of side effects from vaccines. Not that many. So while it's not foolproof, hindi naman siya 100% uh, effective, the 95% efficacy might be enough to create herd immunity if <laughs> all those qualified to be vaccinated, get vaccinated. All right. So, uh, you know, this information is rife during this pandemic. Ang daming disinformation about vaccination. There are people who say COVID is a hoax, etc. But the, pandem the pandemic has also revealed aspects about leadership. Crisis tests leaders. And there's been very few crises that has been a bigger test of leadership than the pandemic, you know? And uh, researchers, journalists, academics, they've been noting, they've been observing some things, uh, some trends that were previously based on anecdotes, which was ito, what do countries with the best coronavirus responses have in common? Women leaders. The most competent countries in dealing with a pandemic are led by women. But this was based on anecdotal observations, anecdotal evidence back in April 2020. This is a more recent observation, January 7, 2021, from Inc.com uh, magazine, which is a business magazine. There's new research showing women leaders perform better during the COVID crisis. So if you go back, uh, if we go back to the previous slide, just to show you some of the leaders, um, yeah, and so uh, these are the leaders of Germany, Taiwan, New Zealand, Iceland, Finland, Norway, Denmark, which have generally handled, and there are other countries, of course, no? but these countries have generally handled the pandemic in a sensible, effective, responsible, humane way. And these researchers, these articles, these research, these research uh, papers are contending that it's no coincidence that these countries are also led by women. Okay, uh, so again, next slide. And then the next slide. Okay, now there are also conclusions, there are also observations that uh, the worst performing leaders, the underperforming leaders in pandemic happen to be men, okay? Uh, from Trump to Erdogan. Erdogan, of course, uh, is the leader of Hungary. Uh, men who behave badly uh, sorry, Erdogan is the, sorry, I think he's the, he's the president of Turkey. Orban is, Viktor Orban is the president of Hungary. So, uh, yun nga, so si Trump, yeah, uh, even our president uh, has made this uh, kind of roster, this, uh, this um, kind of dubious uh, uh, roster of leaders. Uh, Trump, uh, ba Bolsonaro, uh, si Netanyahu of Israel, Bolsonaro, of course, Brazil, See Modi of India, uh, see uh, Erdogan, Putin, Xi Jinping, Duterte, uh, Orban. Now, uh, next slide, please. Um, now, the Guardian, which is a, uh, a very reputable uh, newspaper in the UK, uh, concluded it's the authoritarians who have mishandled and misjudged the COVID nineteen crisis. So it's the women, the women uh, leaders who uh, happen to lead um, mostly democratic countries, you know, New Zealand, Germany, these are democratic and they are democratic leaders. Uh, they uh, handle this crisis uh, better than the authoritarian men. Now, on Harvard Business Review says, okay, maybe it's time that men leaders learn from women. Ano ba ang lessons ng mga male leaders 
na pwedeng makuha sa mga babaeng leaders. Okay. So, it, it uh, describes several. I'm not going to go into too much detail, but just to give you an idea, uh, what kind of qualities uh, women leaders bring to the table and uh, that men can learn. No, I'm not saying that men are incapable. Uh, I'm a man myself, and um, I like to think that I'm not incapable of, of uh, being competent and being honorable, but uh, it just so happens a pandemic has revealed a gender divide. And so sinasabi ng mga researchers ngayon, uh, uh, kayong mga lalaking presidente, prime minister, heads of state, etc., huwag kayong masyadong mayabang. And you should look to your female counterparts to see what they're doing right and maybe adopt some of their values and attitudes such as don't be so bossy. In other words, don't be an authoritarian. <laughs> know your limitations. Be humble. Motivate through transformation or inspire rather than threaten. Don't just create fear. Create confidence. Put your people ahead of yourself. Be more selfless. It's not all about you. Empathize. Establish an emo connection. And establish an emotional connection with the people. Don't just give orders. Don't just crack jokes. But show that you care. And focus on elevating others. Praise others. Respect others. Promote others. It's Again, it's not all about you. But as I said in the beginning, diba? Uh, bossism is focused on one-man rule. Okay, this is the next slide. Now, uh, nearly all tyrants in history have been men. Okay, uh, and we know that, you know, because uh, men have dominated history. So parang uh, just logically, then most tyrants uh, have been men. Um, but uh, times have changed. And there are, as I showed you in that picture, that um, there are many women now who have become heads of state and they've done pretty well. Uh, the vice president herself of this country is from your city. And from uh, our observation here in Manila, um, she said a lot. She said she's, what she's been saying about the pandemic have been very sensible. And she's been very active and um, she seems to be sharing uh, accurate information, truthful information, etc. Okay, now I'm going to be winding down. Uh, just a few, I just want to uh, share uh, what I learned from this book. So Timothy Snyder is a well-known and respected history of fascism, no? the fascism of World War II. So he's an expert on the rise and rule of Benito Mussolini, Adolf Hitler, and um, you know that in the rise of Nazism, uh, you know which kind of changed the world, etc. And he's seeing uh, some frightening and similar trends today. Uh, of course, he's focused on his own country. This is an American uh, historian. He's look. He was uh, talking mostly about Trump and what. Trump was doing. Uh, he, he produced this book in 2017. But it might still be relevant to most of us uh, who are trying to understand our world, trying to understand what's going on in our country, trying to think about our national situation. Okay, so next slide, please. So um, among the lessons that he wants us to imbibe, believe in truth. Okay, uh, kind of a motherhood statement, but if you look at so much fake news going around, parang ang daming naniniwala sa falsehood. No? To abandon facts is to abandon freedom. If nothing is true, then no one can criticize power. If nothing is true, then all is spectacle. Everything is a show. Okay. Next slide. Defend institutions. It is institutions that help us to preserve decency. They need our help as well. So, ano ba yung institutions na to? Universities are institutions in societies that help pre preserve decency. And we know that the government has been attacking certain universities. Di ba? Uh, ano pa yung institutions that need, uh, that need our help? The press, the free press, uh, uh, the courts, di ba? The honest, honest judges need our help. Uh, uh, activist lawyers need our help. Civil society needs our help, uh, etc. You know, institutions defend institutions. Go out on a limb and 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 uh, 
advocate for institutions. Next, please. Uh, investigate. Okay. Again, uh, figure things out for yourself. No, uh, nasa age of enlightenment na tayo and beyond. Wala na tayo sa dark ages. We have agency. We have rights. We have freedom of the press, supposedly. Take responsibility for what you share with others. And this is my uh, own input. Think before you click. Next is do not follow blindly. No, just because someone is elected doesn't mean you have to follow everything that person says or believe everything that person says and oppose people who don't believe everything that person says. Okay? Think of right and wrong. Examine your options. No, Every policy should be examined. Don't support a policy just because somebody else supports it. Do not follow blindly. And finally, Stand up. Stand up for what's right. Do what's right even when others are reluctant. Set an example. Blaze a trail. Have moral courage. And finally, again, blaze a trail. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you, Sir Howie, for that. Uh, that was quite challenging and enlightening presentation <laughs> with small e. <laughs> so thank you so much, sir. And I hope that your talk has uh, encouraged all of us to continually pursue the truth and also you know, be, while being enlightened as well, in, even in these trying times. No? So at this point, um, we also recognize the presence of students of the College Ignatian Formation Program and National Service Training Program Social Sciences Department and uh, Media Studies Department um, of Ateneo de Nagy University. And we also thank our faculty, especially to department heads, uh, Sir J.C. de los Reyes, Ma'am Joyce Borromeo Bulao, and Ma'am Pines Bana. We also acknowledge the cooperation of national and regional uh, officers of PAPSAS. Thank you, PAPSAS. Now, we, we come to our open forum. So at this point, may I now invite our reactors to uh, share uh, their questions or insights relative to the presentation or the, to the theme of the webinar. Um, and then also our viewers uh, are also welcome to uh, post their reactions in the comment sections because later uh, we will try to read all of them. Okay, so uh, please uh, share your comments, reactions through our ADNU OSA Facebook. So also still present joining us in this open forum is our university president, Father Robert Rivera. Hi, Father. And, uh, and also let me remind our reactors that they will be given uh, three to five uh, minutes to perhaps share their comments on the presentation of Sir Howie. So for our first reactor, our first reactor is Mr. Joshua Arsenio Espiritu III. He is University uh, uh, Extension Officers of UP Diliman. Uh, UP Diliman's Institute of Small Scale Industries. Good afternoon, Sir Josh. Thanks for joining us this afternoon. Maray na hapon, Sir Marshall. Thank you very much. Um, I think the presentation, I believe the presentation of, of Sir Howe is history, sociology, political science, investigative journalism, human rights education, constitutional law, global affairs, social development rolled into one. And I think only the Howie Severino can, can do that. So I think he deserves um, a virtual round of applause from all of us here, um, virtually um, convening to talk about what's happening in our country. And I also believe that this is how we make education responsive and relevant to society's needs. Now we don't just settle to reading books, taking quizzes, submitting papers. But most especially, we, we make these things matter to our lives. Because um, we, we don't just learn for ourselves, we learn for the ones who matter. So I resonate with the kind of enlightenment in Mr. Severino's presentation. It is something that I strongly believe in as well. When we are enlightened, we can achieve this. Isang lipunang may likas kayang pinagbabahaginan ng mga mamamayan. Or a, share, a society where sustainable well-being is shared by the people. This kind of society is cognizant of what the people can do and what they can become. That people have fervent aspirations for themselves, 
that is to get better every day, enjoy life, and that their needs are met and sustained. That they must have a strong and stable health condition, especially we've been in, in the middle of the pandemic for a year now. And that people should receive pay equity, access to quality education, and a decent standard of living. Hence, people should have control over one's living environment. But from what Sir Howie have shared, it's a constant battle, uh, tug of war, who controls um, decisions, who controls the power, who controls the resources. But, but the challenge is how do we make our lives free from violence, from oppression? How can we still live out the values of compassion and conscience? How can we enjoy access to opportunities and resources? Mga tugang, and I believe most here are our, our students and, and colleagues in the academy. We have to constantly discern and reflect how do we make education relevant to our society's needs? How can we uphold truth when our inherent democratic rights are suppressed and when being critical of the government is already considered an act of terrorism? These pre-existing conditions are even exacerbated by the limitations that we have now. We cannot go out. We cannot voice out because tomorrow you might be inside um, uh, a jail already. How can we demand for a just society that gives people the access to basic social services? How can we demand for a firm orientation which calls for the democratization of political and economic power and a more intensified involvement of the people, especially the young people who are with us this afternoon in the affairs of our country, both uh, locally and nationally, especially in the challenging times such as the one we have now. Our capabilities can either be expanded or constrained by our very own actions, decisions, efforts, and by the structures and conditions of our country. And we are to make a major, major, major decision again at the 2022 elections. So for those who are eligible to vote already, please do register. Monday to Saturday, ongoing po ang, ang registration ng COMELEC. Because... The kind of country that we will have after 2022 will, will require your active participation, not just during elections. So the question now for us is, will our decision by 2022 will expand or constrain our capabilities? Will this distort the truth? Or will, it, will, it, uh, will we be able to reveal the truth that all of us will enjoy? Obviously, from Mr. Severino's presentation, people at a privileged position have the necessary competencies. They need to expand their capabilities. On the other hand, those poor in capabilities are less able to chart their own course and to seize opportunities. That is the real struggle. Young leaders, grassroots communities, and academic institutions are pivotal to the coming together of people in a process by which resources and decisions are shared and created that will give benefit for all and not just for the elite few. I remember when I was still working as a formator at the Ateneo de Manila University Office for Social Concern and Involvement, I was part of the team that rolled out NSTP in the virtual setup. And I saw in the comment sections that there are a lot of NSTP students na nagsasabi, Mom, present ako. But more than being present in 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 in, in um, events like this, no? sana yung takeaway mabit-bit niya talaga. So to continue with my sharing, it is a challenge to imagine formation program that will truly develop a sense of commitment, especially ngayon. NSTP is uh, usually webinar type or you do donation drives. So the challenge is how will we develop a sense of commitment and vocation among Athenians towards advocacies that will promote poverty alleviation and sustainable development because these things are truly rooted to the Filipino Catholic and Jesuit core. So we have this project that I wish to share that we, we um, partnered with Camarines or National High School, Schools Division Office, uh, City of Naga, where we um, encourage young women, senior high school students to take up their space as would-be STEM professionals. Because most often than not, the challenge is there is a huge gender gap and that few uh, women uh, representation um, in, in the field of science and technology. 
So although Naga is almost 500 kilometers away from Metro Manila, um, it's still possible to conduct formations in the virtual setup. So let me take inspiration from the lofty ideals and values that Ateneo, UP, Lasal share together dahil my fellow members of the panel of reactors are from these universities as well. So to end, as persons for and with others, that's Atenea, Ateneo, we should have the animal Lasal or the spirit to fight with honor and excellence in championing social progress and development that is imbued with social justice. And we are starting to trailblaze. Just my bonus spot saying the boss. All right. Thank you, Sir Josh. Perhaps, Sir Howie would like to respond to uh, Sir Josh's reaction or insight? Sir Howie? Uh, yeah. yeah. Well, I, 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 uh, my Wi Fi came back on. Let me, let me just let me turn off. Uh, let me turn off one of these. All right. All right. Okay. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, Una, yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you for that, um, that thoughtful uh, reaction. Uh, you know, um, I'm, I'm glad that, uh, that uh, our audience today is mostly from uh, universities, no? Because kayong nasa vanguard, no? Uh, uh, for preserving some of these values of the enlightenment that uh, I was talking about, uh, and uh, kayo talaga yung pugad nito, eh. And um, and uh, I just hope that uh, yung the thoughts that we just heard uh, uh, will be will be spread uh, far and wide. And uh, yung atama nga siya, eh, na uh, ang daming restrictions ngayon, ano? Uh, it's actually, these are actually um, ideal conditions for tyranny. Kasi uh, natatakot tayong lumabas ng bahay, eh. di ba? Um, but we can keep this, the spirit of our founding fathers, no? This, this, the spirit of liberty, the spirit of uh, human rights uh, alive. Uh in settings like this, no, in settings like this, and there are there are new um, arenas now uh, online, where we can have our voices heard, and when we can assert our rights, and when we can we can advocate to, for you know, basically a better society. So thank you. All right, thank you, Sir Howie, and also just Mabalo, Sir Josh, for that reaction. So now let's move on to our next reactor. Our next reactor is Dr. Leandro Leola, Director of College of Student Affairs at, at, at De La Salle University, Laguna, and National President of FAPSAS. Hello, Dr. Uh, Ian. Hi, hi. We would like afternoon. to share your, uh, we'd like to hear your thoughts on uh, yes. the presentation. Yeah, hi, hello, Sir Howie, and thank you for that very informative and comprehensive uh, presentation that you have shared with us. I would also like to Greet everyone who's here listening to us and watching us over the, the Facebook page of Ateneo Dinaga, OSA. Uh, hello, Father Robert. And thank you for inviting me and for having me here in this conversation. Well, actually, I would just like to be very candid with my reactions. I actually wrote down some points here as I also contemplate what I understand about enlightenment. So, uh, well, for me, enlightenment, you know, based also on what Sir Howie has shared to us a while ago, is that uh, there's a need for us to be educated. No? And at the same time, to consider the experiences so that we'll be able to bring about post realizations of enlightenment. And uh, enlightenment is also equivalent to truth. You know, that, the, that when we are enlightened, we are actually propagating truth. Uh, however, there are still issues of access to information. And, and when I say information, that's uh, relevant information, especially here in our country. That is why there's still a possibility. Or that is the reason why there's still, you know, the propagation of fake news and misinformation or malinformation, just like what, like what's, what was presented uh, a while ago. No? And um, I think what's important is for us to really discover the truth and to learn from it, and, and most especially to protect it, no? to protect the truth. We can do that by being critical. And sabi nga kanina, yung pagiging skeptical, no? that enlightenment is equivalent to being skeptical. And I think we, we also need to be, to be very critical of the information that we are getting, that we are receiving, and... Uh, we should always ask questions, okay? And I also see enlightenment as a call to action because once you are enlightened, that also empowers you to do something. 
no, or to act on something because you already know what you're supposed to be to believe in, no. And and that also gives you your reason for being. Um, keeping people in the dark is a strategy of the dictators and tyrants, so just like what uh, was mentioned a while ago. And they do not allow people to learn and understand what is really happening, so that they can really pursue and proceed with their evil plans and to gain only for their benefit. Uh, their power that was given by the people, no? supposedly, especially in our case, no, being a democratic country, uh, allows them to pursue their personal interests and agenda, and they no longer see the value and the importance of using that power for the common good. However, in you know, medyo malungkot, kasi culturally, parang the sense of bossism is within us, embedded within us, no? that whoever is in power, we really do bow down. And it's it's just now that we are in the, uh, nga, the age of enlightenment that we're supposed to be asking questions and not really just uh, saying yes to what is being told to us or believe what is being shown on our throats. Uh, but, but of course, that is a big responsibility for the enlightened ones as well, you know? because the enlightened ones, I believe, are tasked to be the bearers and the protectors of the truth. So despite everything that is happening right now, uh, those who are enlightened already or who knows about the truth are supposed to, to protect it and to propagate it as well, the same way that the other party is doing their, their sense. No? Like, they are weaponizing the social media, like the, the many troll farms that we have, especially now, no? and, and uh, that causes confusion and it's really dividing the people, no? especially those who are uh, very active in social media. But yeah, going back, I think the enlightened ones are tasked to be the bearer and protectors of the truth, and they are also responsible to enlighten the people around them. So since you, you have that responsibility to make them understand and then make them believe to what is the truth, they must not in any way uh, also allow or serve as enablers of fallacies and lies. Uh, enlightenment also, for me, allows compassion and empathy because, uh, of course, when you are enlightened, you, you learn about the realities of the, the people around you know, based on their stories and their experiences. And that also allows you to be more compassionate and to empathize to their situations. And uh, now that we, are, that we are in the, you know, the, the era that we all have this access to information and education, I think it's, it's about time for us to maximize it. No? Let's, uh, let's use the available materials the, that we have to know the truth and to become supporters and protectors of the truth. And uh, yeah, let us be skeptical and critical of, of being uh, of questionable and baseless information that are being propagated by some revisionists, no, to be exact. And let us call them out and correct their lies with our facts and truths. Uh, another thing is that I think enlightenment is power. No? And we must use this power to investigate and to engage in discourses that will allow enlightenment also of others. Uh, let's not that let's not be uh, let's not engage to yung mga ad hominem na mga conversations or yung mga gaslighting na ganyan. No? So I think uh, since we are the ones who are Sabi nga, social media is being weaponized, so why don't we weaponize it also in spreading truth and positivity and making people learn what is what they're supposed to learn, no? And and let us uh, start the trolls. I think you know, let us not engage in conversations with them that are not really baseless. And yun nga, I think that would be the best countermeasure that we can do. Uh, another thing, what, what another thing that struck me in the presentation of Sir Howie is how he presented also that crisis reveals the capabilities of the different leaders, no? And and especially, nina nga tayo lalayo, no? Siguro, though he used Trump as an example, but I think hindi na natin kailangan talaga. And we must not close our eyes on this reality, and we must express our dissent and disapproval with the mishandling of the crisis that puts the lives of many in peril or in despair. So, yun, I also appreciated na yung emphasis na parang bumalik sa akin yung recall ng the last man standing is a woman, no? Just like how we described our vice president. No? So, sana talaga all, no? Sana all sa mga ganyang experiences. But I think, yun nga, considering also our traditions and culture, yung, yung masculine, yung masculine culture and the machismo factor, nandun doon pa rin, eh, no? Hindi talaga siya, ano pa siya, uh, siguro we really have to exert effort to, to topple it over no? or to do something about it. I, I also realize no, the responsibility of the institutions. No, tama yung sinabi rin ni Sir Joshua kanina no, of, of getting together and uh, of the institutions and helping out each other to really empower the youth no, and for them to learn and to become trailblazers, to, to give them that opportunity to really do, to blaze a trail and to, like, to enlighten them so that they'll be able to enlighten others as well. 
So, for me, I think it is a continuous battle, talaga, no? to enlighten the majority and to talk to oppressors and tyrants who are exerting efforts to hide the truth or to change the truth. No? But I still believe that we can do something about it and we must act now. So, one, one thing that we can really do, siguro, the, the simplest is really for us to protect democracy by being involved and engaging, like registering for the elections, the upcoming elections, especially the youth that we have right now. No? I mean, uh, I, I, I agree with Sir Joshua and his call also for for them to register and vote kasi yun din yung lagi kong call sa mga students na nakakausap ko no kasi we have really that power to change if only we will be joining together and we will all all be in in one uh, starting one effort to really pursue enlightenment for all the people thank you very much thank you sir howie all right thank you dr ian sir howie thoughts yeah you know uh, you know these are very very sharp uh, comments i'm, I'm Quite, quite flattered that they, they had so they had these takeaways. No, uh, well, I just want I don't want to take up um, more time. I've I've been speaking a lot already. But basically, tama din, No, I mean it's not enough to be enlightened. There has to be uh, there has to be action, a call to action. And yung and that's what's worrisome. Eh? What what kind of actions can we take? You know, from our homes. No, hindi tayo makalabas. We can't uh, usually. Uh, you know, uh, we like to get together with other, you know, with like-minded people and and brainstorm and and uh, and and march and and voice our our opinions, etc. But you know, I mean, there there are alternative ways. I mean, wala tayong choice ngayon. I mean, it's there's a pandemic. We need to survive this. We need to ride this out. But that's that's no reason uh, not to take action. You know, and uh, there are creative ways of doing that. I mean, recently, just an, just an example lang. I mean, I've I've been attending uh, workshops and seminars on how to do Wikipedia editing, editing Wikipedia. It's the fourth most popular uh, website in the Philippines. Uh, you know, right after Facebook, um, uh, Google, etc. And those those are private companies. Uh, Wikipedia is not a it's not a private company, but um, it's a public space and it's an arena for. Debate and battle. No, uh, there's. A, I don't know if it was uh, Josh or or Leandro who mentioned uh, historical revisionism. I think it was the latter. No, but basically, there's a lot of revisionism going on now on the Wikipedia entries of certain uh, personalities. Yeah, I mean, let's. Uh, I mean, I'll, 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 let's be let's be honest about it. No, um, there's a lot of revisionism about the Marcos years, martial law, about even about EDSA. You know, we just commemorated the uh, EDSA People Power yesterday. Uh, you see that there's constant constant edits and re-edits there. Uh, we need enlightened people who know their history, who are on the right side of history, who have the right values, to be in that space. Um, because a lot of students go there for their research, you know? uh, we, we frown upon it, we frown upon Wikipedia as a primary source, but that's often the first place where we go uh, to get information about almost anything. Because you do a Google search, uh, um, very often the Wikipedia entry of whatever su- of, of almost any subject is very high up uh, in the search rankings. And that is an arena for struggle. That is uh, that is where we are also struggling for enlightenment, no? And we want to make sure that um, correct information is there, historically correct information is there, and then when students go there, as the first step in their research, um, they're not being misinformed or disinformed. <laughs> um, so that's that's one arena of action that we can take, even even if we're stuck at home uh, during this pandemic. All right. So thank you, Sir Howie. Now we uh, and also thank you to Dr. Ian for that really good insight there. No, uh, may we now call on our uh, next reactor, Mr. Ken Kenneth Abante. He is a research faculty at Ateneo de Manila University. And uh, Kenneth, Sir Kenneth, what can you say uh, regarding Sir Howie's presentation? Hi, Sir Marshall, and marahin na hapon po sa gabos. Hello from Kanakman. <laughs> Um, very, very happy to be here uh, with you, and it's an honor to be in this panel and learn a lot. Um, I think the most effective way to counter dictatorship is to not fall for the illusion of their tempting shortcut. A dictator plays up a problem as impossible to solve, that we should be hopeless and despair, and that he or she alone, the dictator, is the solution. 
we must reject the simplistic notions that can that complex problems can be solved by one person alone. Marcos didn't save us. Duterte alone cannot save us. Robredo cannot save us. The president may be boss, but he or she is not God. The leader is not a messiah, but a minister who enables and empowers people to undertake the hard, everyday, boring work of citizenship. And we need to work in order to build a better future. This is one way not only to reject dictatorship, but to advance democratic rule as a rule that allows people to be empowered and to shape the institutions that serve us. Now we can view citizenship in a spectrum of the bossist or enlightened way, you know, as, as uh, Sir Howie mentioned. Um, you can see it in a bossist way, you know, where citizens need to be disciplined. There should be a large police force that makes sure that people do the right thing. It's a spectrum. I tend to view it in an empowered way, that when you give the citizens, us, a chance to help, we will help. And this has been our experience time and again. As a Filipino Catholic who believes that people are naturally good, I think we must shape our systems and environments that enable us to be good, to be better. I think this is what magis means in the social realm. This is what I experienced when I helped organize in election and voter registration in Taneo Task Force 2010, when I witnessed health advocates overcome the political influence of the strongest tobacco lobby in Asia and the largest food and beverage company in Southeast Asia to incre increase taxes in tobacco and alcohol to fund universal health care, when 60 plus volunteers responded to our call for help, when we pushed for budget transparency and worked with journalists to report on the budget in the Citizens Budget Tracker for Coronavirus Transparency, even when we helped build the Martial Law Museum for online learning modules in 2017, after the fiasco that was allowing the dictator Marcos to be buried at the Libigan ng mga bayani. When you give citizens a chance to help, we will help. That I think is the Filipino spirit of Bayanihan. It is totally understandable for people to be cynical about politics. But as Joy, Joy Aceron of Government Watch said, politics is not the same as politicking. Iba ang pamumulitika at, you know, iba, it, politicking is different from politics. And politics is the ability of citizens to engage in the power structures that push for the delivery of public services. Let me, let me share one case and a call to action. People say that traffic is impossible to solve. And I think it's, a, it's an area where we can be prone to this propaganda that there is one Messiah that can, uh, that can save us. No, not true. Yeah. But if you dig a little deeper, research a little bit, you'll see this. The solution to traffic is actually to reframe the problem. It's not a problem of expanding road space. It's not even a problem of build, build, build or infrastructure development. It's a question of apportioning and allowing people to move from private vehicles to walking, cycling, and public transport. You see this 10, more than 10 lane road in a road diet because you allow for our streets to move people, not just private vehicles. And private vehicles, pri private vehicle ownership is very actually low in the Philippines. Now, only 12% of households in Metro Manila own a car. Who are we designing our streets for? And so we formed the Move Us One Coalition for Public Transport, which is a broad coalition of civil society organizations uh, to push for a better budget for road-based transportation for protected bike lanes for walkways and road-based infrastructure and better contracts for our transport workers. And last year, we were able to uh, pursue better budgets. Now we have 12.85 billion pesos in direct budgets for active transport and better contracts for transport workers. 
and we all have the power now because of a special provision that we inserted in the deep, uh, that we helped uh, push for. You know, we were many in this movement that requires all road and bridge projects in the Department of Public Works and Highways budget to have protected bike lanes, better walkways, and at grade ground level accessible crossings for persons with disability. Dati po near zero yung budget ng road-based public transportation because, but because a group of citizens care, we were able to push our budget process to serve the people. My challenge, I guess, is let's start local. Uh, let's continue to broaden our movement here in Metro Naga for safe cycling and walking. Help us lobby in uh, Metro Naga walking and cycling community for better protected bike lanes in the Naga area. Let's transform the Hinulid route for better walking uh, and our historic religious pilgrimage uh, routes. Bicicleta Iglesia. <laughs> Events like that where I think all of us can come together and help shape our public spaces to move to move people no? and not just rich car owners. Thank you. All right. So thank you so much. Paraming salamat Ken, for that uh, very specific and context-based uh, insight. Now, uh, now uh, we shall entertain questions from other participants. Again, please state your name, uh, the school or organization you represent. And uh, also, if there's anyone willing, please uh, make your reaction or uh, question clear or forthright and concise. So now, uh, let's call our uh, uh, student reactor, Mr. Jong Rubio, the president of the Supreme Student Government of Ateneo de Naga University. Just marahay na hapon, Jong. Uh, good afternoon po, Sir Marshall, and good afternoon to everyone attending in this National Situationer Update. And first of all, I just want to say thank you to Sir Howie Severino for giving us the presentation on the struggle for enlightenment or the pursuit of truth in the age of disinformation. And also, I'd like to say thank you to the organizers who made this conversation possible. So now, I would just like to raise and reiterate several points from the presentation which I deem is necessary for the relevance that it holds with regard to the events that is happening in our country. First, I also acknowledge that journalism really plays a big role in giving us commoners the knowledge that we need to have regarding the current events. I myself spend a lot of time in the internet and most of the things that I see even in my social media accounts are content which come from the several news agencies present in the country. However, I also acknowledge the fact that despite the presence of several media outlets, it seems that there can still be several twists and turns that affects the mindset of people instead of the facts that are available to them. And these twists and turns can somehow be caused even by the people sitting in power. Now, I would like to reiterate, to reiterate my next point. I firmly believe that our history has contributed to the mindset of Bosesem. If you can recall, we have, and as what Sir Howie has mentioned a while ago, we have a wide history of being colonists for several nations, inflicting us of the master and slave mindset. It seems that we have been stuck or reverted back to the dark ages, since even until now, we are faced with a lot of leaders using the authoritative approach, such that we were raised not to question them. And some of us think that questioning the authorities are somewhat rebellious and a threat to an order, not as an agent of change. To add, this system is further supported by our culture of patriarchy, which is why we find any attributes of masculinity as superior and therefore making us submit to such, even though it would lead us to adverse decisions. Looking at our context, the attacks on freedom of speech has been very rampant following the series of illegal and questionable arrests of several progressive individuals and even journalists, and the shutdown of one of the biggest media outlets, which is the ABS-CBN. 
for the past years, it is undeniable that we have been under a dictator in the name of Rodrigo Duterte. And in fact, he has somehow achieved in undermining the roles of our journalists and news media through the series of outlets in social media with the rise of several trolls inflicting the internet, even spreading fake news or attacking several persons to the grave. Not to mention the recent passing of the anti-terror law, which provides for lesser liability and accountability for faulty actions from authorities against people who are mainly voicing out their corrective criticisms. Sir Howie has mentioned the modern tyranny playbook a while ago, and for sure it made us uneasy and even angry that all the items are manifested in the country. What we can do now is to sustain the strength that we have in fighting for the truth and what is right. Let us shift from our mindset of voicing out for those who are voiceless since everyone has, their, has the same voice. And what we should do is to amplify those voices by creating discussions regarding national issues and other relevant matters, such as the abolishment of several ideologies like patriarchy, misogyny, even bossism and the like. I recognize that many of our values as Filipinos, structures, institutions, and principles are still rooted on patriarchy. That is why it is not surprising that mo most of us tend to just accept this problematic status quo. However, it is not only a privilege, but rather it is our civic responsibility to engage with the affairs of the government despite the certain challenges that we face, which is imposed by the current system itself. Um, and to add, it leads me to a quote, which I have seen in a rally placard. Why are we studying for a future that we won't have? That more than our lives as students, perhaps most of us are students here, or our lives are similar, perhaps our work, we have our shared responsibility in nation building. And as Filipinos, it is our duty to always hold people in power accountable, most especially people in the government. We may never stop to be critical as it is one of our ways in helping our nation. Being critical of the government does not necessarily mean being against them. Um, let us be part of entering our nation's enlightenment by being part of shaping the government that we aim and asking for the kind of leadership that we deserve. So that's all. Thank you once again, Sir Howie, and good afternoon to everyone. All right. Maraming salamat, Jong. We indeed part of that nation-building initiative and, and also, more importantly, governance. No? Thank you, Jong, again. And, and our friend no, from Universidad, Universidad de Santa Isabel Senior High School will also share his insights. So welcome, AJ Tres Reyes, the president of CHS or SHS Student Council. Hi, AJ. Good afternoon. So good afternoon, Sir Marshall. And good afternoon so, to Sir Howie Severino. Also to um, Sir Ian Leandro from, um, from PAPSAS um, National. Um, yes, I would like to, um, to give thanks also for inviting me to this um, national situation. I, um, and I think this is very important since me, myself, I am um, part of the youth. Now, we are um, very confused of, of the things happening around. But in the talk of, of, of Mr. Howie Severino, I would like to emphasize on, on the parts or the things that the youth must consider um, during this time. Because um, the youth are most likely, um, a lot of youth are users of of the different social media platforms. So we are into that na right now. And it is very important that we have that ethics, especially in perceiving um, the information that we um, that we saw in, um, in the social media platforms. But I would like to um, reiterate um, the, the, these things, and I think these are on the book on the tyranny of 20 lessons from 20th century, if I am correct. Number one is believe in in truth, okay, so um, the youth are um, offering themselves using um, social, um, Facebook, especially Facebook. And there are um, times that 
um, there are fake news. We cannot af- avoid that and we sometimes may kilala tayong ganon, may kilala tayong um, reyna ng fake news and we need to avoid that. So, yung mayon nakapunta na ng naga. So, believe that. So, it's a, it's a fake news. So, we need to identify that. Also, the trolls. So, there are instances that um, trolls, these trolls are having their or their their idols or the politicians they are supporting. So, um, it is important that we need also to to avoid this and it is um it is familiar to us especially me myself reading um reading news article um from GMA news from articles we saw a lot of trolls especially especially if that news are um are featuring politicians so ex- for example um that politician is featuring um Lenny Robredo so there are trolls um um giving um hate speech or um commenting um negative information about about her that um that are um very um uh, inefficient and it is um uh, um not that good during these times also um i i want this this phrase uh, this phrase from mr howie's presentation that abandon facts is to abandon freedom so i agree with this if we are always um blinded if we are not um looking into what is the truth or what is really happening in in this society especially in our country then um we are not um in liberty so it is very important next is dif- um different institution um this is um very rampant today especially the red tagging of those of those colleges which are uh, especially student organization who are progressive so ito yung um, sa mga bay na na na-encounter natin during these uh, during these days that um there are some organizations that are being red tagged because of their freedom of expression next is to instigate before we click so we have the rights especially in using facebook and twitter we have the rights to post um our opinions our thoughts but we must also be careful on what we share um be um you must um, especially the youth um we must be um we, we must be sure on what we share online especially that um there um social media platform is um the audience of it is uh, worldwide so anyone can see your can see your post so we need to uh, think before we click next is to stand up and to do what is right so um this is very important especially to the youth um i remember um when uh, mr howie severino um shared this i remember the quotation of rizal that ang kabataan ay ang pag-asa ng bayan and i do believe in that um saying until now so ang kabataan ang pag-asa ng bayan and we are the catalyst for the so- for social change for environmental change and um whatever change that we must do um especially if uh, that change is very important in our society also um in since the 2022 national elections are fast approaching um my my say on that is um we um uh, we the youth or the voters are the one who will predict our future okay so um kung hindi tayo gagalaw ngayon um then those person would like to elect those officials na who are not really um competent and capable then it is our fault so we have to do our rights um we have to register um especially these coming um national election also um i would like to um to emphasize um on um do not follow um follow blindly kasi we are um siguro hindi maiiwasan we cannot avoid fanatism or we have um the idols that we want but we must also not be blind um especially if if that information must must intake by other people must must be perceived positively and honestly so that's all um 
we must also um, remember EDSA because I, um, me myself noticed that the youth nowadays are just um, thinking EDSA as a holiday. Walang pasok, walang gawain. And it's, and it's um, real talk. So the youth nowadays or students nowadays think EDSA is just a holiday or a rest day. So we must also know um, what happened during uh, EDSA or the Marcos dictatorship. And we must also know the history. And yes, that's all. And thank you so much for everyone. And thank you so much, Javi Severino and Ateneo Dinaga University for inviting me in this national situation. At maraming salamat then AJ. All right. So, uh, Father Robert, would you like to give a reaction or ask a question to our presenters or Howie? Father? Uh, yeah, well, well, first of all, just a quick word of uh, uh, thanks, of course, to Sir Howie for the very insightful, very lucid presentation, really oh, inspiring in its breath, no? in its historical breath and insightful depth. No? A uh, warm word of thanks to Sir Joshua Doklian, Sir Ken, for the reactions, and to all our students present here and uh, online. Uh, maybe just to say you know, earlier, not to embarrass Sir Howie, you know, I was telling him before the forum that uh, years ago when Sir Howie was a teacher at the Ateneo de Manila High School, I was actually a student. Unfortunately, I was not in his class, but I remember, you know, this was 1983. 84, if I remember correctly, 83, Ninoy Aquino was killed August 21. No, all the students were talking about it. And we were really looking up no, to the example of uh, back then young faculty, young, talented, idealistic faculty members like Sir Sir Howie and his uh, contemporaries, Mam Lia Lingauco, Mam Lucille Cabunok, um, Sir Jun Balmaceda, who was my own teacher, and, and many of his friends. No? for an example, no? and we were really admiring how they were really deeply involved in the issues of the day. Um, in his talk, uh, Sir Howie cited two books that have been very much influential in my own uh, no, no, modest intellectual development. The first is Samuel Huntington's, Huntington's Clash of Civilizations, no? where he basically says in, in this world, no, the, the cleavages in society will be along religious, cultural lines, not just ideological. And we know how that has come to fruition in ways that even Huntington himself has not foreseen, how that conflict has taken on gender, ethnic, uh, and many other kinds of divisions and have uh, overflowed not only to the real world, but to the virtual world. And the second book, cited by uh, Sir Howie is, of course, uh, Benedict Anderson's imagined communities, no? in the same way that people like Rizal in his writings, in the Noli imagined this idea of a Filipino national identity independent from Spain. And I think this is the main point I want to make, no? especially to our students. I think you, our young people, have the distinct challenge of not reimagining the Filipino community in this world where there are all these conflicts no, that are happening right now. No? The, the ball is clearly in your court. How will you reimagine the Filipino community? Because it is the community that you will inherit. No? So again, I'm very grateful that uh, Sir Howie has really challenged all of us to think about what is happening, but also to, as he said, blaze trails no, for our country and for our future. Mabalas po. Salamat, Father. All right, so before we ask uh, Sir Howie's final thoughts or uh, uh, insight, no? um, may I just acknowledge uh, some questions coming, at least one lang, no? from our student uh, here. Um, it, the question is from Precious Nina Apuya. She said, people are impressionable. What they consume in media often forms their beliefs. This is especially true as we are exposed to particular content which affirms our beliefs and filters other information, much like a filter bubble, which limits our perception. I think what she's saying here is that the, the complex algorithmic um, capacity of social media to filter our information you know, because, yeah, uh, social media is a business. So he, she, she asked, I'm sorry, off your phone call, how then can uh, media outlets uh, contribute in lessening this filter or at least have people be more proactive 
as they encounter news and information propagated by this level or quality of media. Sir Howie? Well, what I would, what I would do as a uh, discerning consumer of information is have go-to websites. Because let's face it, very few of us actually buy hard copies of newspapers, even books, but we, we read them on screens. So we just need to be more discerning. Yun nga eh, um, uh, we need to be enlightened, basically, and have, a, have an attitude of being enlightened when we decide what to read. Diba? Uh, because um, that basically forms our values and our attitudes and our choices uh, about society. So, have a list of go-to sites, you know, kasi kung ano-anong lalabas sa Facebook uh, feed mo eh. And then, if you just click on anything your friends or anyone else shares with you, uh, and, uh, and and think, because in endorsement ng kaibigan mo, then it must be true or it must be worth sharing or believing, etc. Um, you know, you have to uh, apply your own discernment nga eh. Um, you have to exercise your agency, your 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 power. Because you know, two-edged sword itong internet. Eh. And the social media is 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 also a two-edged sword. No, I mean it's empowering, uh, uh, but it's also very dangerous. No, it can actually lead you down to a rabbit hole, or it could lead you. It could actually lead you to really bad things. I think the reason why a lot of these Trump followers joined the riot, and now a lot of them are in big trouble. No, in arresto, they're under investigation. They're, you know, they're they're careers are ruined, etc. Because they were not very discerning. Diba? Kung anong sinabi ng leader, yun na yun. They were not skeptical. No? They didn't have alternative sources of information. No? So, uh, yes, uh, we're kind of in a bubble ourselves. Um, yeah, there's such a thing as uh, as a silo, meaning uh, yung echo chambers. No? Uh, that's, that's why uh, yung, yung go-to sites natin should not just um, include sources of information that we agree with, but basically uh, the source of information that's going to challenge us and make us think. But they, they need to be reputable, diba? There's so much information out there. Yung ang problema natin is too much information where sometimes we, we don't know what's a good source or a bad source or a, or a source of false or accurate or true information. Um, that's where we need to really work. And that's why in sa ano sa K to 12 in in include yung media literacy, di ba? As a subject. Because um, the education authorities um, recognize that it's one of the biggest problems right now is is just the lack of discernment when consuming uh, information. Thanks. That's a good question. Right. And and and, and sir Howie, if I, I I know I'm I'm the moderator here but if I may ask questions sir Howie um, do, do, you, do, you, do you now observe our journalists in terms of um, facilitating and supporting uh, the engagement and the participation of, of, of the citizen, of social media influencer? How, how are they framing uh, this information? How, how, how are they providing helpful context uh, in terms of uh, halimbawa, uh, live fact-checking when you cover uh, President Duterte's uh, state of the nation uh, uh, remarks or that that late night you know show um because we, we see in western uh, news that they are also live fact checking no matter on the spot fact checking or in, in some cases cutting off the the source of falsehood are, are we are, are we really observing this in in philippine media um you know it's hard to generalize about um uh media or the journalism profession i mean it's, it's like it's like generalizing about all students or all doctors or lawyers, et cetera, no, or all politicians. It's uneven, no? It's a, it's a, it's, it's a very diverse uh, industry. Uh, you know, they're very honest journalists, but they're also corrupt journalists, no? Um, and uh, just like in any profession, no? So it's, it's hard to say what we're all doing, if, they're, if we're all doing anything in common, right? But I think most of us recognize that there's a problem and we're dealing with it in different ways. Um, there are some uh, media organizations that are more proactive than others. 
there are some that actually try to do live fact checking, although that's one of the most challenging things right now, especially with the current president, diba? Uh, where you know uh, he often doesn't stick to the script and uh, you know speaks off the top of his head um, and is very unpredictable and sometimes he doesn't make any sense. Um, so it's very difficult to, I mean. Never mind fact checking. I mean, it's difficult to try to understand what he's saying most of the time, diba? Um, pag nagla live statement yan, and it it's created a debate about whether you know whether it's doing anyone good for 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 him to be covered live. Um, you know, maybe some people have suggested let's just record, you know, and then try to uh, edit out the nonsense, the 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 the, the profanity, the hate, etc. And kung ano man yung bagong policy, new decisions, the the useful information, yun ang ititira. But uh, it's hard to get everyone in media to agree to these things, no? So the default is just to air him live, because if ang danger nito to fact checking about anyone is. Uh, especially if it's impromptu, especially if it's you know sim almost simultaneous or live, is what if the fact checker is wrong? Diba? And if you're doing anything fast, diba? you're like live tweeting, diba? you could misquote. I mean, it's so easy to misquote. It's so easy to have a typo. It's so easy to mishear, let alone hear, hear someone accurately and then you know, kind of tap into a storehouse of information in your mind or at your fingertips and almost instantaneously fact check somebody who is live i mean it's it's easy to i mean it's kind of easy sometimes to imagine oh you should be uh, fact check i mean we've been criticized for that no it's you should be fact checking while the while uh, the president or press secretary or the spokesman harry roque are talking etc well uh that's easier said than done no because uh, a lot of people would hesitate because you're not going to be 100% sure either about your own correction diba um fact checking is easier if you have time to fact check basically uh, the speed of the internet, the speed of Twitter, the speed that technology is forcing us to keep up with is actually the and is actually anathema to accuracy. Diba? Uh, my, my kasabihan, I mean, I do documentaries for a living, and one of my favorite um, uh, documentarists, uh, one of my favorite sayings. Uh, in documentary production is time is truth time is truth the more time you devote to something whether it's a research whether it's a report etc the closer you will get to the truth you know and if you're trying to cover anything instantaneously at very high speed especially live there's a high chance that you're going to make a mistake so um that's that's one uh that's one aspect of my answer um uh, the other is um, that being said, uh, iba iba yung uh, responses. Namin, we are talking about it. Uh, the ones uh, in our industry, in our profession, who are taking this profession seriously, um, you know, we have we have conversations. We have a lot of private conversations. We we um, we we we're going through a lot of angst about this because we're trying to balance a lot of emotions and perceptions and. Um, scenarios here. Uh, I think Nabanggit uh, Yata, sorry, uh, yung, I can't recall everyone's names, uh, yung student leader, he mentioned, um, you know, uh, media organizations being being shut down. No? I mean, one of the biggest TV stations, ABS, was shut down. No? Um, and, uh, and, and other journalists uh, and media entities have been harassed, uh, persecuted, um, you know, they've been subject of lawsuits, etc. Um, that's not just a message for them. It's a message for everyone else, right? So, as I mentioned earlier, uh, in the playbook is intimidation, the creation of fear. Um, so, uh, so in in this current in this current environment, 
there may not be a need to jail all the journalists. All you need to do is create a fear that what has what has happened to others might happen to you. And it, it doesn't apply just to journalists. It applies to, um, you know, uh, activists, lawyers, um, uh, you know, uh, universities that have been red tagged, diba? Parang, I'm sure uh, university presidents like Father Rivera is, is uh, kind of wary, is kind of worried na baka kung ano-ano yung sabihin tungkol sa uh, Atene, whether it's true or not, diba? Uh, and, uh, you know, parents will be calling, etc. No? So uh, we're all kind of, um, we're all kind of walking on thin ice, no? Um, that's the kind of um, environment we're in right now. Uh, and um, that's why uh, it's, it, it's, um, it's an act of bravery, actually, to call for action and to actually act on one's enlightenment. Kasi kanina, I think several of you um, made calls to action. Tama yun, no? But um, um, it's, it's um, uh, action, action in response to the national situation or even your local situation uh, is an act of courage these days. And it's not something that we can ease, that many of us can easily do. And that we shouldn't take for granted. So, um, uh, it's a very complicated uh, situation right now. Um, you know, um, social media has been weaponized. The law has been weaponized. There's there's been red tagging. There's there's you know there's the anti-terror law right now. There's a cyber libel. Um, there are, you know all kinds of ways of intimidating uh, people. Um, you know, I, I, I did four documentaries about the drug war. You know, so I've been to the I've been to the homes of people who had just been killed. Uh, I mean, and their families were there. Pinasok yung bahay nila, no? Na pinatay sila just because they are suspected of using drugs. And to me, um, the enlightened way of looking at drug addiction is it's a public health problem. It's not cause for kind of gangland in, uh, execution, diba? Any kind of addiction is a public health problem, whether it's tobacco, alcoholism, uh, uh, heroin, uh, shabu addiction, or any kind of addiction. Uh, and there are all kinds of addictions, you know, there's addiction to chocolate, etc. These are health issues, diba? These are, but if you say that, ito troll ka, you'll be, you know, uh, you'll be threatened with uh, death yourself, or, you know, what, what ano maari mangyari? Um, it's you know it's it's even sometimes dangerous and frightening to speak out. Um, so uh, you know, ano eh, that's the environment we're in. No? So um, I kind of welcome these opportunities to um, uh, to speak out, diba? and to share uh, and to hear and to hear uh, brave voices uh, like yourselves. No, I mean uh, I think all of you. Uh, Make sense to me and uh, give me hope, no? Because all of you uh, who have spoken, including your university president, you're all younger than me, you know? <laughs> and uh, that gives me hope. Uh, gives me hope that you uh, know, Father Rivera, no, he was inspired by my generation. I mean, uh, we all went into teaching. I had five, five of us from the same section in fourth year high school. Uh, we all went back at the same time to teach at Ateneo High School to give back or to pay it forward, no to our alma mater and we were motivated uh, by idealism we all got uh, caught up in uh, you know in, uh, in activism and, and people power and fighting tyranny and dictatorship until we won right and uh, uh, the generation of father rivera was not just a witness to that i think he was uh, probably heavily influenced uh, by what he saw when when he was in high school and uh, what he saw in uh, young teachers uh, then and uh, i think um, a lot of you uh, are at that age when I was um, an, an idealistic uh, Filipino. I still I like to think that I'm still uh, that I'm idealistic, but uh, you know I'm no longer <laughs> that young. Um, but I think it's it's possible to to stay idealistic and to stay enlightened and um, function uh, in society. Be be practical. I have a family to be practical and idealistic at the same time. And I think you're all on the right track. And um, 
you know, I've heard a lot of good things today and it's given me a lot of hope and made me optimistic uh, despite everything. All right. Thank you, Sir Howie. I think that's how we want to conclude our open forum in as much as we want to accommodate all questions because we still have a lot. Uh, we don't have time anymore. Kasi. Sorry for that, guys. But uh, um, let's see if we can email this back to Sir Howie and Sir Howie can uh, reply to us. <laughs> no pressure though, <laughs> Sir Howie. Yeah, no all problem. right. So uh, th thank you, Sir Howie, our reactors and all those who took part in our open forum. And I am 101% sure this webinar has, uh, has been both informative and enlightening with small e for all of us especially to our students now to our uh, to show our gratitude for our resource speaker for his time and effort despite his very busy schedule nako we now present uh, this uh, e certificate of appreciation let me read the citation i hope the the e certificate is flashing right now there you go so the certificate reads the Office of Student Affairs at the Nedinaga University in cooperation with the Philippine Association of Practitioners of Student Affairs and, uh, and Services, PAPSAS Region 5, presents the Certificate of Appreciation to Mr. Horacio Hawi G. Severino in grateful recognition of his generosity as resource speaker in National Situation Update held on February 26, 2021. Given this 26th, uh, day of February 2021 at the Ateneo de Naga University, City of Naga, Philippines. Signed, Mr. Leo Jeremiah Arnel Ocaayao, the Program Officer for Student Leadership Development. Mr. Randy P. Inigo, the President of PAPSAS Region 5. Mr. Rodolfo Bertus Jr., Director of Student Affairs in PAPSAS Region 5, Vice President and Father Robert Rivera SJ, University President of Ateneo de Naga University. Thank you, Sir Howie. Thank you. At maraming maraming salamat po talaga. <laughs> um, yeah. Hmm? Okay. So uh, we, we now have come to the end of our uh, program. So to those who registered, uh, this is just a reminder, e-certificate of attendance will be provided to you after uh, accomplishing the evaluation. And also the link will be provided and sent uh, to your email, I guess, I think. So we hope you enjoyed this seminar and uh, gained new learnings from our program, because I, I did. And uh, yeah, I think the challenge here is to continue the, that practice, no? defend institution, investigate, do not follow blindly, no? but, but also promoting good governance, especially in this new normal. And also, if you, don't, uh, if you haven't yet, no, please register and participate uh, this coming election. So thank you, everyone. Ingat po, Diyos Mabalos. Uh, we also want to request our uh, invited uh, reactors to have a, a group photo daw. Sabi right. ni Leo. <laughs> yeah, pl please email it to me, uh, Leo or whoever. Uh, we will. Uh, I, I also I want to send a copy to uh, Father Rivera's former teachers because they were on the same Viber group. <laughs> Thank you, Pastor <laughs> Howie. Thank you. Very inspiring. <laughs> Regards to former teachers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. See, see JP. Was JP or Beta your teacher also? Or? No, po, it was Ajun uh, Balmaseda, uh, uh, Leo Limcauco. Our yeah, moderator yeah. in Asil. Ah, wow. And you mentioned Lucille? Uh, I think Leo is requesting uh, to have a photo. So, should I count Leo or Icona? Yeah. Okay. So, in three, are we ready? Okay. In three, two, one, smile. Okay. Thank you, guys. And good afternoon, Paul. Salamat, Sir Howie. Father Robert and our reactor. Thank you. 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 Thank you